Come through, take me home to the place I belong. Norfolk class, yeah, take me home. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. And today we're talking about the Norfolk class. Um, why they stopped why did the royal navy not get all the norfolk class the royal navy was planning on building five they had built planned to build 10 kents they built seven of them two for the australians they planned to build four london class they built all four of those they planned to build five Norfolks. They built two. They planned to build five Yorks. They built two. Why did the Royal Navy in 1926 to 1928 plan to build ten heavy cruisers and yet they built four. Of all the county class cruisers, the Royal Navy at various points has plans for roughly 24 ships. Yes, that doesn't work with the tonnage allowance, I do realise this, but that was their plan. 24 ships at various points are being considered. Starts off with a batch of 10, then there's a batch of 4, then supposed to be a batch of 5, and then that scans up another batch of 5. So 24 ships ordered. And yet the Royal Navy takes delivery, including those for the Royal Australian Navy, of 15. Nine ships don't get built. Nine ships. Leaving the whole realities of the treaties to one side for a moment, nine ships more in terms of heavy cruisers. How would that have imp impacted the Royal Navy? That would have been mighty helpful. Even if they hadn't built the Yorks at all, if they had built the full five Norfolks, they would have still had 16 heavy cruisers between the RAN and the RM. And let's be honest, a Norfolk... Well, that's a mighty fine ship. They are. They are mighty fine ships. The design, if I expand this out, as you can see, is not colossally different than its predecessors. They have the same standard displacement as the original Kent's, but they have a lighter full load. They have the same length, and broadly speaking, the same beam as the London's. And they have the deepest draft. Of all of them. Their power is broadly speaking the same. Their top speed is 31 and a half knots though. 
which is down from the 32 and a quarter knots of the London class. But it's the same as the Kents. Their complement, 710 in standard, 819 during wartime, fits right in with the other two subclasses. They have the Mark II guns, which as we all know, were desire, uh, supposed to be lighter than the Mark I's, and as so, they accepted them not being able to get up to 70 degrees in terms of their firing, and turned out to be heavier, and were definitely not able to do the 70 degrees. They have quad, four, uh, no, they have tw four twin uh, uh, four-inch guns. They have two octuple pom-poms. And they have torpedoes. And they have machine guns. Their main belt fits in roughly with the London class, which was lighter than the Kent's. Their armour is there. It's good quality armour. And like other counties, they receive a measure of an upgrade, it seems. The class has two members, Norfolk and Dorsetshire. As planned, there was Surrey, Northumberland, and an unnamed vessel. Norfolk was ordered from Fairfield Shipbuild Engineering uh, Shipbuilding and Engineering Company in Govan in July 1927, launched December 1928, and completed in May 1930. Dorsetshire was laid down in September 1927, launched in January 1929, and completed in September 1930. Surrey, Northumberland, and the unnamed fifth member of the class were all cancelled in January 1930. So the question is, what changes things in 1930? And that's why this week there is going to be two episodes. It's going to be this one on the class. And there's going to be another one on the 1930 London Naval Treaty, looking at specifically how it applies to cruisers. Because both are needed to explain it. HMS Dorsetshire, Iron Brew Bottle Down, is a wonderful ship in many, many ways. She's named, of course, for Dorset. And she is built by the Portsmouth Dockyard. Her motto, Pro Patria et Continua, for country and county, and is of course sunk in the 5th of April 1942 during the Indian Ocean Raid. Her and Cornwall come under heavy air attack and are sack lost. Which is a shame because she had been part of Force A, which is important to think about because Somerville had grouped his ships together into Force B and Force A. B was the fast or was the slow force, A was the fast force. A was centered upon Warspite, Indomitable, and Formidable. So Dorsetshire being part of that, along with Cornwall, shows their value to the force. Because he has one fast battleship. Heavy cruisers matter. 
they could well have to take some of the strain for the battleship, which is not really the RN's doctrine for what to use heavy cruisers for. Remember, the RN's doctrine had always been based around the idea they had enough battleships to do the battleship fighting without needing the heavy cruisers to worry about that too much. The heavy cruisers job was to do what heavy cruisers had lived to do. Be a deterrent to battleships and battle cruisers, be a deterrent to bigger things, and be a demon to smaller things. But Dostra's career had been far more than that. She'd been flagship of the second cruiser squadron. She had been part of Atlantic Fleet during the end of the Gordon Mutiny. And noticeably on her ship, because she was quite a happy ship and she had quite good officers. While some of her men had initially refused to assemble for duty, it took 90 minutes for the ship's officers to manage to persuade the crew to go about their duty, carry on, and know that things would be dealt with. And Dorsetshire had no further unrest during the mutiny because the men, the crew, trusted those officers. When her captain at the time turned around to his crew and said, it will be dealt with to my satisfaction. They understood what that meant. They might not get all their demands, but they would get their demands listened to, and they would get them, they would be paid attention to. They wouldn't just be mouthed pl pleasantries or platitudes. The captain cared for his crew. There was no one going to get uh, do better for them than he would. And that is something which goes right across that mutiny. You realise that the RN had managed to try and keep the Gedzaks, uh, from the Gizaks and the various other things, the best officers they could. And they'd done a fairly good job in keeping good tactical operators. But... Not all the officers they kept were actually good at look at managing their crews. Or rather, they sounded good on paper. And when they were talking to their peers, they sounded like, excellent. Oh, yes, I have this wonderful idea. But they didn't actually really build the report. And I often point out that the end of the Gordon Mutiny is one of those things which really reinvigorates divisions and the other crew and personnel management systems that the Royal Navy still describes to this day, they had been growing lax in their professionalization and adoption of staff and other things. These things had been allowed to drift a bit. The mutiny reminded them of the importance of them. And there have been, still been issues. There is no Navy which has been without blemish. They have managed to do quite well thanks to that. And Dorsetshire is one of those ships which you that, that's modelled on because she did have a good working system. The officers did know their crew's names. They did understand them and the crew felt respected by them. Yes, they still had to follow their orders. Yes, they were in, the officers were in charge. That doesn't mean the the crew could don't the crew have to respect the officers for that, but also if the officers respect the crew, you have a far stronger ship. From nineteen thirty three to thirty five, she served as flagship for the commander in chief Africa. Then she's replaced that role by Amphion. And by 1930, September 1935, she's assigned to the China Station. In fact, in February 1937, her, along with Hermes and HMS Cumberland, one of her elder sisters, participated in exercises to test the defense of Singapore against a hypothetical Japanese attack. This took place in 1937. 
again. I mention this because when I uh, one of the things when I'm talking with people is they go, uh, well, you know, why was this ship not built to counter this ship of a particular Axis power? And you can't do that. Because if you build your ships to, t to take on one Axis power, then they won't be able to fight the others because they're all different. So you have to build the ships to fight in the roles you need them to do. And you figure out how you're going to take on the Axis powers with the ships you have. For example, the Royal Navy's county class aren't built to fight the Panzer Chief. They can do. Let's be honest, the cut price county HMS Exeter does. And a few other points as well, at the time, uh, the time as well, county class cruisers end up engaging German heavy cruisers. But they also fight Italian heavy cruisers and often need to make runs through the Mediterranean protecting convoys just in case Italian heavy cruisers do show up. If they don't show up, then people look at their 8 inch guns and go, huh, pointless. If they do show up, then those things suddenly become important. It's the same with the six inch guns. It's the same with a lot of weapons on a ship. You have to carry them because you can't suddenly go, oh frig, the enemy's changed. I need to order up a resupply emergently with this equipment. It doesn't work like that at sea. And that's the big problem with the idea of fitted for, not with, as well. Where are you going to fit it with it? If this is fitted for, wonderful. Where are you going to actually fit it? When are you going to fit it? After war's begun, you're going to take the ship offline for six or so months while you fit these systems and integrate it? That's good fun. It's going to cause happiness. In 1939, Dorset is still on the China Station. And eventually she goes, takes part in the pursuit of the Grass Bay. And she's assigned with her sister, HMS Cornwall, and the aircraft carrier, Eagle, to go and hunt the Grass Bay. And she does that. She's uh, heading along, and she's actually in 9th December at Colombo, and then ordered to pre proceed to Tristan da Cunha, and then to Port Stanley in Falklands in order to relieve Exeter. She doesn't manage to get to the Graf Bay in time, but she actually left December, uh, South Africa in December 19, on the 13th of December in con in company with her and another sister, HMS Shropshire, and is on transit to pretty much the River Plate area. Oh, sorry. On the 17th of December, when the Grass Bay is scuttled. It's part of the many forces heading there. This is the other point about the Grass Bay and any surface radar. Once you've been forced to go into harbour, you are mission killed. Because the enemy knows where you are and they're going to have everything heading in your way. Dorsetra was part of that. She then had a refit in Simonstown before returning to Britain for a more thorough overhaul. She continued to hang around in that area and actually um well how do i put this she actually managed to get involved in the wakama incident because well how do i put this on the 11th of february her reconnaissance aircraft spotted the german supply freighter the, freighter, the wakama off the coast of brazil and the, it's promptly scuttled by the crew. Dorsetshire arrived on the scene shortly thereafter, picked up 10 officers and 35 crewmen, sank the Wakama to prevent her from being a navigational hazard, and 
The following month, the President of Panama decides that he's going to send a formal complaint to the British government protesting against Dorsetshire's violation of the Pan American Security Zone. I'm, I, I'm absolutely certain that Winston Churchill, when he got Augusto Samuel Boyd's note, was most disappointed. I'm, I'm sure he was absolutely, absolutely disappointed. Um, in May, Dorsetshire had her refit in Simonstown. In June, she was sent to watch the French battleship Reculu, which had left Dakar and Casablanca two days later. Uh, uh, left for, you know, Dorsetshire rendezvoused with the aircraft carrier Hermes off Dakar, and Reculu was ordered to return to Dakar by Admiral Francois Delon, that noted naval strategist, um, later that day, arriving there on the 27th of June. While she was monitoring the French Navy off Dakar, the submarines Le Heros and Le Guru of the French Navy attempted to intercept her. Dorsetshire was able to evade their attacks through various high-sphere manoeuvres, but this shows the reality of it. It was not as clear-cut as we sometimes imagine the Vichy French forces being really not wanting to be part of the war or not wanting to be fight on the German side. Some of them were very outraged by Merzel Kabir, which you can see as justification, and some of them just saw it as we're now, our government's now changed its view, and these are going to be our friends who are enemies, and so we will fight them. And French submarines were often an issue. Hermes and HMS Australia joined her there, and the squadron was ordered to issue an ultimatum to the French fleet to either surrender and be interned under British control or scuttle the free ships. The French refused, so a fast sloop was sent in with orders to drop depth charges under the stern of Riccolo to disable her screws. In September 1940, she was dry docked in Durban, and then later that month she arrives back in Simonstown. Sails to Sierra Leone, operates in the Indian Ocean, and actually bombarded Zante in Italian Somaliland in November that year. December, she took part in the search and the hunt for the Admiral Shear, which had sunk a British refrigerator ship, Dunkeska, uh, in the South Atlantic. The British were unsuccessful in that hunt, and the Admiral Shear managed to get home safely. That particular cruise is one of the things which is often less appreciated about history. We talk about the Graf Spee, we talk about the Deutschland, and we talk about her later uh, her change and what she becomes as Lutzow. We don't often talk about the crews of the Admiral Scheer, which honestly is worth studying and looking at. She then takes part, of course, in the hunt for the Bismarck. And It's actually Dorsetshire and Maori, which at the end are left behind to try and rescue people. And in fact, from the sinking bit smart, this is, uh, Dorsetshire managed to gather 86 aboard her. HMS Maori, that wonderful tribal class destroyer. Managed to rescue 25. Unfortunately, one of those rescued by Dorsetshire died. It was late in August 1941 that Dorsetshire participated in the hunt for the Admiral Hipper. Uh, she was in a task group comprised of herself, HMS Eagle, very useful little carrier. 
and HMS Newcastle, a town class cruiser. Let's be honest, that is not a group which any German uh, any German cruiser would really like to have meet up with them. Because that's something which is going to do 6 inch spam, something which is going to do, hello, we have torpedoes, albacores, to drop them. And one something which is going to do 8 inch spam. Unfortunately, they were unable to locate her. So, they then end up taking part in escorting a convoy of troop ships from Halifax to Basra. Yes, the troop ships. Troops started off in Halifax, Canada, and they went to Basra, Iraq. And she escorted them as far as Cape Town. Then after they had a break in Cape Town, she took a, she was escorting them all the way to, theoretically, to Basra, but they were instead diverted to Bombay because of rising issues with Japan. In November, she goes off hunting the Atlantis. Unfortunately, she doesn't manage to find Atlantis, but she does end up being formed into Admiral Aldrin Willis's Task Force 3, uh, along with her sister, Devonshire. Patrolling the likely locations for Atlantis. Dorsetshire does manage to intercept the German supply ship Python, thanks to Ultra Intelligence. And the ship at the time was actually um, refueling a pair of U boats. The U boats dive. Python tries to flee. The U boat tried to fire torpedoes at Dorsetshire, but all missed her due to her evasive maneuvers and possible torpedo reliability. And Python's crew decide to abandon and detonate their scuttling charges uh, uh, as the, you know, the British ship was so, uh, was so close. However, due to the fact that the U-boats were still present and still trying to manoeuvre and fire at her, um, she sent a message to them which basically said, well, your countrymen are in their boats, I'm going elsewhere. Makes sense. And then, of course, she's lost in 1942, March. Rather sadly. She could have been very, very useful. All these cruisers were useful. This is something which you get into really strange debates with people who go, well, you know, Britain should have built this, Britain should have built that. And you go, yes, for that scenario, more of those would have been useful. But what about this scenario and that scenario? And that's the problem which cruisers, and especially the county class, are part of. And that is one of the reasons why the counties get curtailed when they get curtailed is that the RN feels they have a better plan for how to solve that square, that sort of triangle, or square to circuit at least, of problems. Because they're not allowed, they're not going to be allowed to build as many of these as they need. If the RN had their choice, their heavy cruisers would have probably been cap toting around 12 9.2 inch guns in four treble turrets, they'd have had possibly even a pair of six inches of secondaries. They'd have definitely had 4.5 inch secondaries if they could have got away with it, upper deck mount. And they would have been a cornerstone part of the Royal Navy. But treaties hadn't allowed that, so the Royal Navy had to work within the treaties it was as it was allowed. And what it did was quite successful. Now, HMS Norfolk, which manages to serve the whole war through and gets awards and honours for the Atlantic, for the Bismarck action, for the North Africa campaign, for the Arctic, for North Cape, for Norway. Well, she's a slightly different beast. Slightly different. 
paste. Her into war service. Well, her crew was a different scenario than Dorsetra's. They were a part of the mutiny that became the Invergordon mutiny. Her officers were an interesting bunch. Some did quite well afterwards. Some found their careers curtailed. As a result, the ship served with the home fleet until 1932 and then was sent out to the American West Indies Station. Uh, it's based on the Royal Navy Dockyard in on Ireland Island in Bermuda. And she served there from 32 to 34. Spent much of her time cruising around Americas. Uh, with Sometimes alone, sometimes with other cruisers. She turned up during the Cristero War in Mexico to um, <clears throat> make sure British interests were being remembered. And then from 1935 to 39, she served with the Commander-in-Chief East Indies, coming home for refit in 1939. She was still in dockyard hands when war was declared. This didn't stop her being assigned to something. She was assigned to the 18th Cruiser Squadron of the Home Fleet, which is a powerful unit which the Royal Navy was putting together. She was involved in the chase for the Nisenau and Scharnhorst, along with the hunt for the uh, Admiral Scheer. She as a result of these incidents, ended up having to have repairs carried out in Belfast, especially after damage from a near-miss torpedo, U-47. Uh, it was, also, of course, the same submarine which was uh, responsible for sinking Royal Oak at Scarpa Flow. So, a fairly good sub, which I've been fairly lucky. She got bombed at Scarpa Flow in March 1940, and this time she was repaired at the Clyde. After these repairs, she proceeded down the river time for a new addition to her equipment, radar. So she received that quite early. In December 1940, now with a fully worked up radar kit and a fully worked up crew and use of radar, she was on the South Atlantic duty patrol for trade protection duties. Operating out of Freetown as part of the then Force K, she took part in the hunt for Admiral Shear. In November, January 1941, Norfolk, under the command of a Captain Phillips. I don't think any relation to the, mo uh, to the movie character Tom Hanks played, but you never know. Joined in the search for the Comron in the South Atlantic. In February, she escorted troop convoys. And by May, she'd returned to Icelandic waters. Norfolk was the second ship to sight the German battleship Bismarck. And her and Suffolk would trail the battleship for as long as they could. So these, in fact, two cruisers would get the honour of joining Rodney and King George V as part of the force that finally sank her. From September onward, she was part employed as part of the escort for various Arctic convoys. When her sister Dorsetshire was bombed and sunk by the Japanese in the Pacific Theater, uh, Pacific Theater, they did actually consider dispatching her to the Far East to take her sister's place. However, Norfolk at that particular time was part of the cruiser force covering convoy JW-55B as it engaged the Scharnhorst. December 1943, she scored three hits on the ship, ship and received mm, a few 11-inch shell hits, all of which passed through the thin-skinned armour of the county uh, without exploding. 
And that's really sort of an advantage of the county class design. I mean, it's something you have to think about when you're talking about county class cruisers and heavy cruiser armour in general. You have to always think of your armour. Do I want it thick enough to keep out 8-inch shells, but that also might be thick enough to de detonate an 11-inch or a 12-inch or a 14 or 15 or 16-inch shell, which would really ruin my day. It's better if those things pass straight out the hull. So that's why the armour is where it is, why the armour is sort of the belt structure below. and So the idea is you have an all-or-nothing system of armour so that the armour can be thick enough to resist, hopefully at least, of a heavy cruiser far where you need it to. But it's thin enough that it won't detonate a rather larger shell where you don't want it to. Now, of course, one of the things she's most famous for, royal family, to Norway. That is what Norfolk is very much famous for. Now, originally, I had a quick bit in here, which just went, and of course, she was chosen for the same reasons that her sister, Devonshire, was chosen for the evacuation and was famous for the evacuation. And we'll be getting back to the, re the regular video in a second. But apparently, YouTube managed to lose it, and I didn't spot it when I did my run of it. And there is occasionally a small trouble, because I have a similar issue when I record these, and I listen to them as I do sometimes with my writing. If I don't leave them a while, and I listen to them through quickly, I insert the correct bits, what I meant to say in my head. I hear almost the correct stuff. I already think I do. Which is annoying. Occasionally needs to do some seriously stupid errors sleeping in, which I mostly I catch because I go back and listen to it again. I try and this is why I try and upload at least a week before, because I go back and listen to it again about four days after the time I hear it. But I am now going to be taking volunteers over Discord who will happily show me their Gmail account, because that's what you need, and I will set up a system whereby people can listen to it early as checkers, if they wouldn't mind volunteering. So, if you're interested, please contact me on Discord, and I'll try and do a sort of couple of people and I'll try and arrange some sort of thank you but that would be really really helpful because starting to annoy me and you'll be able to see all the videos early but you'll be going through them to check them and tell me exactly in timestamps where if I've gone wrong anyway back to the recording thank you is she was the ship which evacuated during the Norway campaign the royal family of Norway and several of their government ministers. And really, that is part of her duties, but that's also something which... If it had been done properly, rather than scratched together, and this again is something I will always put at the feet of Lord Korkori, because he is part of it. It would have been sensible for Glorious to have been tagged onto her, for the Fast Destroyers to have been tagged onto her, because that's a very valuable cargo and you're putting it all down to one cruiser heading home. And there's an argument to be made for a single cruiser heading home with a valuable task. I know it was used for delivery of um, various nuclear components, etc. around the world. A single fast cruiser. But there's a difference to doing that when you're in open ocean than when you're in the scenario where they were. Because, yes, we talk about what happened to 
the carrier, which is caught on its own. But what would have happened if Winshaw had been caught on her own? For Norfolk, when she's returning the royal family, she's got an escort. For Devonshire, Norfolk had been caught on her own. She's a powerful ship, but if Sharnors and Nisenau had come out and had caught her on her own, well, it wouldn't have been the Battle of North Cape. They're both capable of 31 knots. She's capable of 31 and a half knots. So she has a half a knot speed advantage. That's not going to be enough to open up the distance. Not quick enough. That she pulls it off is a miracle. But the idea that her presence would have saved Courageous and Glor uh, would have saved Glorious by her firepower is wrong. What would have saved Glorious would have been the presence of the Admiral aboard. Because John Cunningham would have gone, where is my aerial reconnaissance? Because he wanted aerial reconnaissance. That's one of the things he actually asked for a carrier, is according to one report I read. He wanted aerial reconnaissance to help him make sure <laughs> He got them home. Because he knew how important these people he carried were to the free Norwegian forces. And more importantly, to the use of the Norwegian merchant marine that would be critical to the war effort. When you start looking at it from that value, not the Norwegian military forces, but the Norwegian merchant marine, which is huge. That was a very, very high value good he was transiting on. A very high value good. So, for starters, why was Surrey and Northumberland uh, Surrey and Northumberland cancelled? And what was the fifth one going to be called? Well, my bet is York. Why? Because there's rarely an HMS Yorkshire, and it's kind of like HMS London and HMS Berwick. In every single set of the counties, which are called counties, there has been a mayor. There has been a traditional city, a traditional city name also used, London. Berwick. The odds are York makes sense. It's the obvious one to go for. It's either York or Exeter, and York is more likely. Because there's already a Devonshire in the class. Plus, they do go York Exeter when they're building the Cut Price Counties. So that makes sense, but why cancel them? Why cancel Surrey and Northumberland? It's because of the stupidity that start uh, that has infected British governments at this point. In front of, before the Washington Naval Treaty, as has often been known, many cherry trees were cancelled. In the ca in the case of Britain, they cancelled the free Admiral class battle cruisers and didn't consider con uh, didn't well they did consider but didn't go through with the idea of converting them to carriers. They cancelled the larger cruisers they were looking at building. They cancelled all sorts of things because of the Washington Treaty as a gesture. Well, on an international scale, scale Ramsay MacDonald decided this would be a gesture for him to do. 
But actually, they were also cut as an economy measure. The minority Labour government saw them as a, saw it as a way of saving money after the 1929 general election. In fact, Surrey and Northumberland would have been roughly two knots slower. They'd have been a slightly modified version of the Norfolk design, but they would have had more armour. Slightly slower. 29 and a half knots top speed, but slightly more armour. Officially. And this is some of the planning for them. Unofficially, I think myself they might have found that the speed remained about the same. The reason I say that is because there were a few ideas being thrown about on terms of the pressure of boilers they were going to put in them. And main reason they're supposed to be slower is because of their weight. Well, they had pretty much the same guns. They had the same... structure, the same layout, they only had more armour. That's only one change. The iron has a habit when it introduces changes of introducing at least two in a class. That's what it had done with capital ships in the Dreadnought race, that's what it had done with all sorts of other scenarios. At least two changes. There is also, when I look at the costs being suggested as they're being saving in terms of boilers, etc. I have a feeling those boilers might have been slightly higher pressure than their previous counterparts. So, they might have managed more shaft horsepower. They might have been conservative with their estimates. And they might well have maintained the speed. It's an option. Honestly, thanks to Ramsey McDonald, we will never really know. But it's decisions like this which are what have left the opinion of many people that Labour seeks to cut the fence, Conservatives are the people who are part of the other fence. It's kind of like in America where you have this idea that the Democrats want a small military but to do lots of things with it and the Republicans want a big military, but to do nothing with it. When the reality is, when you looked at history, basically the, as a rule with the Democrats, they want to put, uh, they want to increase the military funding by a slightly less than Democrat uh, than the Republicans do, but they still tend to put up the budget, and the Republicans tend to be just as active with their military with the military as the Democrats. Especially if we consider recent years. Trump was actually less active than most previous presidents, but not by much. Enough to be noticeable, but not by much. And certainly not to return that to that sort of idea and trope. In terms of defence spending, well, in the UK, any political party seems to like to cut defence whenever they think they can, because they always have better things to spend their money on. And this has certainly been the case since post World War One, even pre World War One. A lot of the dreadnoughts race and the idea behind dreadnoughts was getting more value for less spending, not because the country can't afford the spending. Don't get me started on that one, but because it is it, they want to spend the thing money on other things. And those other things they might consider a higher priority with voters. They might consider it better for the country. There are people who consider spending money on defence to be wasted money. It's kind of like supermarkets. The purpose of a supermarket is to turn a profit by selling goods usually based around food, but often they have household items and alcohol and 
clothing and various other items in there for sale. Spending money on security, if you're looking at it from a simple cost in terms of profit generation perspective, would seem pointless. After all, the security guard is not going to stock your shelves. The security guard is not going to sell your wares. The security guard is just going to stand around. It's a cost-benefit perspective, and it's the same with the fence. Governments are not supposed to create a profit. It's not the government's purpose. Limited companies and private companies, they create a profit for their shareholders, owners. That is their purpose. They invest capital and they expect a return on that capital. Or at least gainful employment. Governments are not like that. Governments are a group of people getting together and pooling a portion of their income in order to generate the services they need for society to run. Now, these services can be healthcare, if you're in the UK, NHS. They can be justice, police, courts, jails. They can be firemen, fire, fire personnel, uh, ambulance, patient, makes sense to pull it together because if everyone contributes a certain amount a certain percentage of their incomes that money's pulled together and it can be made a best use of for everyone roads infrastructure infrastructure that thing i'm going on often about so often about and is so essential for actually having a decent economy and decent society and actually building most of what we understand in modern life, the infrastructure is often taken ground of sewage, fresh water, all these things can be paid for that by that way. Defense is part of that. Because if you think about it, only the very rich could afford defense for themselves, let alone the country. Which is why, again, Royal for, uh, royalties had often provided it. And that was the purpose of the feudal system. The idea was everyone worked for the monarch and in turn the monarch protected everyone from another monarch coming in and beating them up. And because war's bad so the whole idea was basically a deterrent. If we have a rich monarch who can have a massive army and is known as a fierce and strong warrior then no one else will want to come in here, so we'll get some years of peace. And therefore, peace is prosperity. Why do governments see defence as an option they can cut? Well, in America, defence is... And this is going to sound terrible to several people listening to me, but defence is the great bastion of socialism. Pork barrel politics, creating employment around the nation, that is what the defence budget does so, so well with America. Which is probably going to upset people, but that's the case. Have a look at the spending. In the UK, because it, and I'm using the American UK systems, but I'm, there are other systems you can look through. In the UK, the scenario is slightly different. After World War One, everyone convinced us, everyone of themselves that that was the war to end all wars. So why are we spending money on defence? We just need to look like we're spending money on defence for the public, and you know. But no one actually wants to go to war because everyone suffered the same way and come away with the same experience in the Great War. No one's come away from the Great War with the idea that war is a good thing where they get what they want. <coughs> Japan. <coughs> or horrifically changed into something that they are completely different than what they were before. <coughs> Russia. Or uh, come with a burning desire to redress what had, been, what had cost so much blood to come uh, to create. <coughs> Germany. <coughs> no one. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of the world and of war. And this has continued on. 
let's be honest. After World War II, if it hadn't been for the Cold War, there was already a cut going on, but then comes in the Cold War. At various other points during the Cold War, the British government makes the distinct impression that, oh, we're going to focus on this because uh, that's politically more vital. We can't cut anything out. We can't if we cut that, that's going to cause us political problems, whereas if we cut that, no one will care about it. And that's why we end up with the Navy we have in 1982 versus the Army we have sitting in Germany in 1982. And don't get me wrong, I can understand and see the strategy behind the Central Front. There is a strategy there. But for Britain to abandon its traditional maritime strategy as much as it does to support that, it seems predicated on the idea of any war being short, nasty, and nuclear. And you often come down to perspective that all the Soviet Union had to do to win the Cold War if it turned hot was stop it going nuclear and keep it going for more than five or six days. And considering the sheer amount of stocks of T-55s and T-34s they had in uh, had ability to mobilize, where, whereas most people didn't have quite as many mu museum-grade uh, equipment to um, deploy, they might just have been able to do that. As long as it didn't go nuclear. If you want a good example of how that idea has continued on today and that wars are either a thing of past or something we'll choose to do, look at the multiplications of ships. If you buy one ship, you are buying a token, a capability you will have on occasion. If you buy two ships, you usually have that capability on call, but not necessarily immediately available. And both ships might well be in port at the same time, in which case they could theoretically, to an enemy who is willing to think laterally, be vulnerable to certain other forms of attack. Mortar from a pickup truck, perhaps. But, if you have three, usually you have it one at sea. Four, that's a guaranteed one at sea and guaranteed capability. And that's the reality. If you can divide something by four, that's guaranteed capability. If you can divide something by three, that's pretty much, usual, uh, that's pretty much capability at sea. If it's multiples of three, then it's if it's more than four and still multiple three, then it's guaranteed capability, of course. So if it's six, nine, twelve. Twelve means you can pretty much guarantee to have four at sea at any one point. And that is the reason why the strategic deterrent is four boats. To guarantee one at sea. That's guaranteed capability. But the Royal Navy's carrier force is two. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because it's important to think. The Royal Navy's carrier force has been defined by both Labour and Conservative. The fact is, British governments for years have been reducing these, uh, they're reducing the systems they're buying. There's a reason the British Army is such an infantry heavy force. Because infantry are cheap in comparison to armour. They are. Because infantry, if you can more rapidly equip, you can't buy new tanks quickly. So you have to either invest in them or pretend you don't need them. And they get me started on poor Air Force. The Air Force has uh, a lot of teeth. 
and it has a lot of transports. Tankers. Airborne early warning, and I would argue maritime patrol aircraft are all short. And if you want an answer of why, well, transports were regularly featured as they were going backwards and forwards in the news to Afghanistan and various other people flying the soldiers home. So they couldn't be cut. And the typhoon, well, that was the big Eurofighter project. And that's the sexy thing which flies across the sky. So I've been rambling for a few minutes into the modern world. Where does this <coughs> ascribe to what are most likely Surrey, Northumberland and York? And why they're ca and they're cancelling? Well, this affects the approach and what we're going to get into when we start discussing the York class and the Cut Prowse counties. Because in many respects, they had to look like they covered the role they didn't actually have to cover the role. Whereas these were being built to cover the role of heavy cruiser. And it's interesting that the Royal Navy has dropped down the speed requirement and up the arm requirement. I would argue that Surrey, Northumberland and York, if that's what it was, as the full counties, would have been ships which were orientated more and more around fighting and defending convoys from surface raiders. They would have been the response to the panzer ships. Royal Navy couldn't really afford to make responses to everything the enemies produced up, but maybe, just maybe, they thought they needed a response to these ones. Or they thought that they might be heralding more to come. <clears throat> 